Well, in uh, this particular session, we're gonna talk about one of my favorite things. We're gonna talk about your specific ministry environments. And I think one of the things that um, sets our churches apart from others, and this was particularly true um, when we first began you know, 18 or 19 years ago, that we just had extraordinary ministry environments. And we didn't try to take church environments and improve them. Basically, we just abandoned church environments and started over. And our, in those early days, our staff, they would take all kinds of field trips to all kinds of organizations and business. And, and we had two staff members that just could not stay away from Disney and they kept coming back with ideas from Disney. And I'm like, do we look like Disney? Do I look like Mickey Mouse? Don't answer that. Do we, do we have that kind of budget? And they would say, but just let us try. Just let us, just let us try. And so I would just you know, keep my mouth shut and walk into environments and try not to say, how much did this cost? How much did this cost? Because there was this side of me that just like, do we really have to have Sharpies? Can't we just buy Bic pens? You know, do we have to hang a dozen things from the ceiling? Couldn't we just have one nice thing hanging from the ceiling? You know, does it have to be eight different colors? Could it just, you know, does it all have to be? And I learned early on, and I had to be taught this, that environment matters. Environment really, really matters. Because as we're gonna see in this session, environment, the physical environment, communicates something. And whereas I like to load up in words, and I love to wordsmith things, and I love words, there are other people who communicate through uh, visuals, and through colors, and through dimensions, and through lighting, and through all kinds of things I know nothing about. And when you set people free to use their gifts and their talents to create environments that are both great in terms of how they look, how they feel, how they sound, and the content, then amazing, amazing things happen. And it really is an overflow, we think, of the gifting of the Holy Spirit, that everybody has a spiritual gift. And when you set those gifts free to do creative things, amazing things happen, as many of you have already discovered in your ministry environment. So let's talk about this together. It's one of my favorite things to talk about, I think, because it's one of those things that we've seen God use in such an incredible and extraordinary way. So if you have your, your workbooks with you, we're in session three. And uh, I just wanna read this introductory paragraph that's in your notes to you because it's gonna kinda set the tone for where we're gonna go for the next few minutes. It says this in your notes. It says, everyone involved in your ministry from staff to volunteers is measuring the quality and success of your environments against something, including how quality and success are defined. So what that means is every single person that comes to your church or to any of your ministry environments every weekend, they're measuring, they're, they're deciding was that success or was it not a success? And they're determining whether or not it was a success based on their definition of success. Now you may never do a formal evaluation, but you know this, don't you? Everything you do is being evaluated. I tell pastors all the time, look, you know, everybody there is evaluating your sermon. You might as well listen to some of them. And you know, guys say sometimes, well, I don't like people to tell me how to change things. I don't like to hear it. I don't like to watch it. I don't like to listen to myself. And I don't like the way my voice sounds. I said, well, you know what? It's all being evaluated anyway. You're just not learning anything from the evaluations. So inviting evaluation is an important thing. It's the only way to get better. Continuing on, as a leader, it is your responsibility to determine what success looks and feels like in each of your ministry environments. Now, this takes some time. That's why we don't do it. As a leader, it's your, uh, it's your responsibility to determine what is success. What is success for children's ministry? That no one gets hurt? I mean, is, is that it? No one got hurt? Is success every parent got their kid back? Is that it? <laughs> We don't care what happens, what they learn, what they eat, you know, what it smells like. Every parent got their kid back. We're, I don't know. You could, you, you do, but the thing is, you have to define success for every ministry environment and then communicate that. Once you've clarified the win, now I want you to underline that or circle that in your notes because that's a big phrase for what we do. Once you clarify the win, what do I mean by clarify the win? That is, you look at every ministry environment and you ask the question, what's the win? What's the win? Not what's the goal, that's different. You know, not, not, again, did everybody, did anybody get hurt, but what's the win? On our very best day, if we got it exactly right, if we did exactly what we came here to do, what is the win? And for every ministry environment, the win is one or two sentences, not paragraphs, because nobody's gonna remember a paragraph. Clarify the win is to boil it down to one or two sentences. What was the win or what's the win for that environment? Once you've clarified the win, it is imperative that you train your staff and volunteers to execute with your definition of success in mind. The clearer you are about what success is, the better they will perform and the less frustrated you are gonna be. 
And when I say less frustrated, you know, the less frustrated you'll be, many of you have been involved in churches or maybe you're involved in a church right now and you're the leader, you're a volunteer leader or you're a staff leader and you're just frustrated by what the volunteers are doing or you're frustrating about, frustrated about how well or how um, not well your team executes. And you go home frustrated and I guarantee you, people who serve under you or serve with you go home feeling like they did a great job. And they go home going, it was a great day. And you're going home going, it was a terrible day. And they're like, we had a fantastic time in Upstreet. Or we had a fantastic time in Sunday school. And you're going home going, oh, that was a disaster. I hope nobody, you know, nobody even remembers what happens. Because as long as you're evaluating success differently, you can have a group of people that think they're making an A. And you're going home thinking they're making a C. And you're frustrated. And the way to resolve that is to clarify the win, define success in such a way that everybody understands it and that everybody can work toward it in the end. Now, one of the things that we get a little pushback on, I won't spend too much time on this because I think if you're here, you, you already drank the Kool-Aid, so I don't have to convince you of this, okay? But one of the things that happens sometimes when I talk to church leaders in general about this content and we talk about creating environments, I get pushback that says, well, Andy, that's because you're, a, you're trying to be attractional. You're an attractional model. You're always just trying to get more people and just get more people. We're not that kind of church. You're just attractional. And, and I say, yes, we are. I mean, that, that, yes. We wanna attract as many people as possible. And by the way, if you bought chairs for your auditorium, you should put butts in them. That's why you bought them. If you have empty seats and you don't have people in those seats, you have a problem and you can be critical of us because we're attractional. Why did you buy those chairs? Why do you have classrooms? I mean, if you create space, don't you want the space to be full of people? So never ever make an, a, you know, any kind of apology about being attractional. Read the gospels. Everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd. There was a crowd. Read the book of Mark, it's the shortest gospel. And just mark every time you see the word crowd. Everywhere he went, there was a crowd. Now, if I could do miracles to attract a crowd, I would. The best I can do is hire a band, okay? <laughs> If I could feed you know, people with, you know, with five loaves and you know, a few fish, if I could heal, touch people and heal them, you know, if I could make blind people see, I would do that. And you know what? If I could heal at will like Jesus, I would have a crowd and so would you, no matter whether you could sing or speak or no matter what you look like. If you could heal at will, you would have a crowd. I can't do that, neither can you. So we have to come up with other things. And I'm not apologetic, and I don't think you should be either, about working hard and organizing around how do we get more people to experience the environments we create, and how do we get more people to hear the message that we have, because we think our message is the most important message in the world. And I believe that most of you, maybe all of you, are creating extraordinary environments for kids, extraordinary environments for high school and middle school um, students, and that they need to participate and benefit from your environment. So we just don't make Make, you know, apologies. Some people say, well, you're just too consumer oriented. I'm like, well, we are consumer oriented. And by the way, if you have an air conditioning in your building, you're, you're bowing to the consumerism. You know, if you have doors and windows, you're bowing to consumerism. I mean, humans are consumers. What did Jesus do? He gave them food to consume and he gave them health to consume because people are consumers. And leveraging the consumer mindset in order to present the gospel, that's not a problem. That's what Jesus did. You don't ever have to apologize for that. So anything we can do to get people to hear what we have to say, short of sin, we'll do it. Anything we can do to draw a crowd to hear what, you know, of students or children to hear what we have to say and what Jesus has to say through us, we will absolutely do it. So yes, we're very attractional or we try to be attractional. And besides that, what's the opposite of attractional? Not attractional. That's easy. Do you know how much effort it takes not to be attractional? Just visit most churches. That's why there's nobody there. That's why you can shoot a cannon through their auditorium and all you hit was the pastor and maybe his family. They're just, you know, they're just kind of scattered around and they sit in the back. You know, they're not attracting anybody. And here's the thing, they're not worried about not attracting anybody. The only thing that makes the average church worry, the only thing that makes the average church worry, it's not that they're not baptizing anybody. They don't worry that there's no children. They don't worry that they have five kids in the youth group. The only thing that makes the average church worry is when the money starts running out. And when the money starts running out, then they get real concerned about, we need to reach young families. But the issue isn't young families, the issue is the money starts running out. So you're not gonna be that church and we're not gonna be that church, so we're just gonna be attractional. And you know what? If you attract people and if you present the gospel and if you do fantastic ministry, you're gonna have the money that you need because here's what we've learned. Non-Christians and new Christians oftentimes outgive the old Christians. 
The largest gift we ever got up until about five or six years ago was from a brand new Christian. And he gave us a big gift and we were all shocked. And he said, I have some catching up to do. And I said, do you have any friends? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I, I, it might've crossed my mind. Okay. <laughs> the other thing, and I gotta move on. The other thing about this whole attractional thing is here's, here's what the gospel, here's what the gospel, here's what Paul taught us. That when we're together, we are the what? The body, thank you, the body of Christ. See, we, by myself, I'm not Jesus. By yourself, you're not Jesus. You know, to, you know, but when we get together and use all of our gifts, we're the body of Christ. So the greatest thing we can do for a non-church person isn't just tell them about Jesus, that's good. It's not just personal evangelism, that's good. But the best thing we can do is to involve them with a group of believers that are being the body of Christ. It's very, very powerful, it's very, very attractional. I love the story of, of Nathaniel and the story of the woman at the well because Nathaniel essentially said to his brother, we, you know, when he heard about Jesus, and you know, I think it was Philip said, hey, you know, can anything good come from Nazareth? And, Naz and, Philip's like, and Nathaniel's like, well, just come and see, just come and see. The woman at the well, she goes into her town, you know, a Samaritan city, a little village and said, hey, there's a man who told me my future. Or, and excuse me, there's a man who told me all about my past. And to which most of the men were like, everybody knows about your past. I didn't take a prophet. She's like, no, no, I'm not talking about that. There's a man and, and they were like, we don't believe you. And besides you're a woman. And she said, just, just come and see, come and see. If I can just get you in the presence of this guy, you're going to be convinced. And we believe that when we get together, we are as close as to, you know, we're as close to being with Jesus as you can be this side of death. We want people to come and see. So we don't mind trying to be attractional. We don't mind inviting people. And we don't mind working hard to create environments that reflect excellence and reflect the greatness of God and reflect the gifts that God has given us, given us working in tandem together. So what we did is, is we did what I just told you in the introduction you need to do. We sat down and asked the question, okay, what's success? What is the win? And so in, in Deep and Wide, at the end of Deep and Wide, we list all of our wins for all of our ministry, various ministry, so you can you know, get an illustration of that. But then we stepped way back and we said, you know what? We're in the business of creating great environments. So let's define for our entire organization what it takes to create a great ministry environment. Is it 10 things? Is it five things? Is it eight things? Granted, the application will be a little bit different between children's ministry, student ministry, and adult ministry, but what are the common ingredients? What are the essential ingredients for a great ministry environment? And we came up with three. And these have been our marching orders really for over 18 years. Every Every time we think of student ministry, adult ministry, the worship service, anything we do that's an environment, these are the three things that we use to evaluate success in terms of our ministry, our, our ministry, ministry environments. Now, before I give them to you, and, and some of you have heard these things before, or perhaps you, you've read them in the book, here's the deal. You may not like our three, that's okay. You may think there's four, you may think that you know, one of these is completely irrelevant, it's okay. These aren't in the Bible, this is just our list. Even if you completely reject everything I'm about to say, I wanna challenge you to sit down and define for your church, your student ministry, your children's ministry, your church, what makes a great environment a great environment. Define it and then teach it, and then refine it and teach it, and refine it again and teach it so that everybody in your organization is working off the same map, working off the same page, working from the same set of directions so that you are evaluating the same way and you're changing things based on an agreed upon evaluation. So here we go in your notes, three essential ingredients. Number one, an appealing setting, an appealing setting, an appealing setting. By setting, we're talking about the physical environment of your building, the physical environment of your classrooms, the physical environment of your rented space, your physical environments, let her be in your notes. Settings create first impressions, you knew that. An uncomfortable or distracting setting can derail ministry before it begins. An uncomfortable or distracting ministry environment can derail ministry before it begins. Years ago, when we didn't have a facility and we were setting up, tearing down, we were meeting every other Sunday night. We did that for three and a half years. Sandra and I visited a lot of different churches because it was, you know, I was free on Sunday morning. We were meeting on Sunday night. And we went to one particular church we'd heard so much about. Oh, that's the greatest church. You need to go there. And we'd heard about it for years, so we showed up. And Andrew, our, was our, he's our oldest, and he was a toddler at the time. And uh, we came to check in where you check in the kids and we showed up and there was one guy back there in a completely empty classroom 
And he was, came up to the door. And honestly, I thought he was a little bit creepy looking and I'm being judgmental. But when you're a parent, let's face it, you judge everybody who's about to touch or talk to your kids, don't you? If you don't, you're not a real parent. That's right. So I was very judgmental. And so here comes this guy all by himself, looked like he's in his early 20s. I looked in the classroom, there's nobody else there. And so we're gonna check in Andrew. And so we signed, the, actually we didn't sign anything. He just will come on in and we're like, well, do we need to sign anything? No, you know, he'll be here when you're finished. So little Andrew toddles on in there and I'm looking in there. And in the back, there's an open door that goes outside. I can see this, is an, you know, there's something out in the back. Now I found out later it was an enclosed playground, but at the time it just looked like an open door that went outside. So here's one young guy in a room with my little boy, don't sign anything, put him in there. So yeah, some of y'all shaking your head, I can see like, no, not gonna do that. So we go and we go down, to, down the hall to the auditorium. There were no signs, I remember that, nobody to tell us what to do. So we get in there, we sit down, you know, there's music playing, the worship leader gets up. We start into the first song and Sandra turns to me and she says, do you feel good about that situation with Andrew? I said, no, and I think I got half the no out before she was gone, <laughs> and we never went back. Now, she went back there, and there was another adult in the room, and there were some other kids in the room, and she walked around and found out it was an enclosed playground, but that was it. We were completely distracted. Had nothing to do with their theology, had nothing to do with whether or not it's a great church, might have been the finest church in the city of Atlanta for all we knew, but that one little thing was so distracting to us, we sat there through that first half of that first song and both of us, all we could think about was, do we need to go back there? Do we need to go back there? Now, that's kind of an extreme example, but here's the thing. Nobody at that great church had any idea what was going on in our heads. They're just doing church as normal, isn't things great, let's all stand and sing and na 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 and we're like, we could not stop thinking about that situation. So the point is this, the physical setting, what things look like, how they're arranged and organized are extremely important because uh, you know, the wrong uh, setting can be distracting. Number, letter D in your notes, every physical environment communicates something. Every part of your physical environment, every physical environment communicates something, everything. Now, you don't think in these terms, maybe, but everything communicates something. For example, in your notes, clean. Clean communicates, we were expecting you. When is your house the cleanest? When you're expecting who? Company. When company's coming, you, you get cleaned up. So now, is cleanliness next to godliness? I don't know, but I'll tell you this. Cleanliness says we are expecting guests. Everything communicates something. Organized. Organized communicates we are serious about what we're doing. We're serious about what we're doing. You will almost never walk into a national bank that doesn't have an extraordinarily organized, fastidiously decorated, and very minimalistic foyer or lobby. Because people know that communicates, we are serious about what we're doing. You can trust us with your money. Now, next to your money, your children are the most valuable thing you will ever have or raise. In fact, they're more valuable than your money, right? It's, I didn't mean it in that order, but next to money, yeah, <laughs> children. For some of you, it's money and children. For most of us, it's children and money. So if children are more, is more valuable to us than our money, what does that say to us or what should that say to us about the environments into which parents check their children in? It has everything to do with the environment because the environment communicates something. An organized communicates, we are serious, we anticipated it, we believe that what we're doing is extremely important. In his uh, wonderful little book, The E-Myth Revisited, which our staff has read and reread, it was one of, if not the very first book that we read as a church staff um, almost 19 years ago, he says this, a business that looks orderly says to your customer that your people know what they're doing. A business that looks orderly says to your customer, we know what we are doing. So even if you know what you're doing and it's not organized, it needs to be organized so you communicate what's true about your church and that is you know what you're doing. The third one is safe, safe. Safe says we value your kids the way we value our own. You need to have a check-in process. You need to have a check-in process if there's only three kids and they are all related to you. You need to have a check-in process because check-in process says, we take the safety of your children as, as, you know, as seriously as you take the safety of your children. The point being, everything about your physical environment communicates something that's extraordinarily important. Letter E, design, decor, and attention to detail communicate what and whom you value the most. The, attempt, the design, the decor, and your attention to detail communicate what and whom you value the most. Now, when you walk up and down the, uh, the halls of our churches, all of our churches, you will be, you can't miss the fact that children are important to us 
because of all the attention we give to our Kid Stuff Theater, our check-in uh, for Wombaland, check-in for Upstreet. And this is true of all of our campuses. And if you've been in our network for very long, I've seen pictures and visited some of your churches. The same is true for you. Now, all that signage and all those animals and all those stuffed animals and all that stuff, that is not for the children. Who is that for? It's for the parents. The kids don't even see it. The kids are this tall. If we wanted them to see it, nothing would be higher than that, okay? Because it's all down there on the ground. All that stuff and all those colors are for parents to go, wow, these people love children, which we do. We value children. We take children seriously. Um, years ago, Sandra and I went to a huge church and I, was, I don't preach at churches very often on the weekend. This was about four years ago and I made an exception because it's a big church and they asked me to come. And so we were backstage, uh, we were in the green room between services with the pastor and his wife. And I said, I would love to tour your children's areas because I just love seeing what people are doing with children. And the pastor's wife kind of breathed deeply and she went, well, we don't do it like you do it. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, that it, we just, and, and you know, she kind of hem hawed around. Essentially she said, we don't take that part of what we do seriously. And sure enough, Sandra went and toured and she came back. She said, not good. It was, you know, it was just minimal. It was concrete walls. There was no paint, no color. They did it with the children in mind, not the parents in mind. And then I noticed when I was preaching in this particular church, there were lots of babies, lots of children. They even had babies in there with big like headphones on to protect their ears from the music. And I'm thinking, why don't you put them back there where the babies are supposed to go? And after Sandra reported back, I thought that's why. They just, it's just not a priority for them. So all of that stuff's important because it communicates something. And we live in a culture, like it or not, we live in a culture where people worship their children. You say, well, we shouldn't give in to that. Well, you don't need to give in to it. They just aren't gonna come to your church. So if you love them, give in to it, feed them, heal them, gather them up, and preach them the gospel. All right, um, letter F. Design decor and attention to detail communicate whether or not you're expecting guests. We kind of talked about that. This is why signage is important. This is why all those things that we overload on in terms of trying to get you to communicate well are important. And then letter G. Periodically, we all need fresh eyes on our ministry environments. Periodically, we all need fresh eyes on our ministry environments. And here's why. Fresh eyes, this is very important. Fresh eyes see things that we don't see, that others see immediately. Fresh eyes see things we don't see, but that guests see immediately. Now, there's two kinds of people in the world. And if you've ever hired babysitters, you know this to be the case. There are people who see a mess and there are people who don't see a mess. And the people who don't see a mess, messes don't bother them because they don't see them. There are people who do see a mess and before they can do anything else, they have to clean up a mess. You had babysitters, you came home and you could walk in the door and see everything your kids did and had to eat while you were gone. Because there was a pile of toys here, the TV was on there, there was a pile of toys upstairs, there was a dirty diaper next to the changing table and there was still food on the counter and there was an open pizza box and your babysitter was sitting there at the counter just so happy to see you and you walked in and just couldn't believe what you're looking at and she just sat there and talk, 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 didn't bother her a bit. We've had babysitters where we would clean up the mess while the babysitter talked. Didn't even, didn't even dawn on her that she was part of the mess. And we would just laugh about it because there are people who can see a mess and people who can't. Now here's the thing. It's not a sin not to see a mess. You may not enjoy heaven, but it's not a sin not to be able to see a mess. But it is a sin if you're in charge of a ministry environment and you can't see a mess and you haven't asked someone who can see a mess to speak into that because you can't see a mess because your ministry environment should not be messy, not because it's sinful, but because that communicates something. So if you're a person who can't see a mess, Hey, you need, you need somebody who has permission to speak into that. Now, let me help you discover real quickly, you're not gonna like this, whether or not um, you are a person who can see a mess or a person that can't. I want you to visualize right now the back seat of your car. <laughs> and if I, you were to give me a ride and I was gonna sit in the back seat and you'd have to say, excuse me while you reach back there and there were paper cups and some coffee cups and some Chick-fil-A stuff and some McDonald's stuff that somebody else put in there, you don't eat McDonald's, and some... <laughs> In other words, in newspapers, and you'd have to kind of clean the clutter. And it's not clutter that's in there because of what happened earlier in the afternoon. It's clutter that just kind of lives back there. Then you're gonna go to heaven when you die, but you can't see a mess. 
And it's okay to mess up your car. It's not okay to mess up your ministry environment. So somebody needs to have permission to speak into that on your behalf. Okay, that's enough of this. So here's some questions to ask, and you can talk about this on your way home. Ask, are your ministry settings appealing to your target audience? Are your ministry settings appealing, visually, audibly appealing to your target audience? Do the design, decor, and attention to detail of your environments reflect what is and who is most important to you? And what's, third one, this is an expensive question, what's starting to look tired? What's starting to look tired? We have that question, that's one of the reasons we're doing construction out here in the front. Every once in a while, we just realize, you know what? We're accustomed to this, this doesn't bother us, but if we were new here, if we brought fresh eyes into this hallway, into this ministry environment, to this building, it's starting to look tired. If you care about reaching people, if you care about guests, you've got to ask that question, even though sometimes the answer is a little bit expensive. Okay, that was number one. Second ingredient, second essential ingredient, an engaging presentation. An engaging presentation, letter A, or under that in your notes. Engaging presentations are central to the success of our mission. They're essential. This isn't an add-on, it's not a nice to have, it's essential. Presenting the gospel is a primary responsibility of the church. In other words, primary to what we're doing is presentations. We're not presenting environments, we're not presenting paint colors, and we're not presenting you know, new songs, we're presenting the gospel. So presenting things is essential and presenting things is central to what we do. Teaching them, as Jesus said, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you is the, the unique responsibility of the church. Teaching them to, com- to, to obey everything I've commanded you, it's, it's our unique responsibility. So consequently, we have to, if we're gonna make presentations, which we are, we're in the presentation business, our presentations need to be engaging. That's the key word, that's the word we came up with. Letter B, to engage is to secure one's attention. To engage is to secure one's attention. So we decided that we wanted to be outstanding at every level of presentation throughout our entire organization. And of course, we don't get an A every single time, but I'm telling you what, it bugs us like crazy, whether it's children, middle school or transit or in here, it bugs us when something isn't engaging. It bugs us when the announcements aren't engaging. It bugs us when the person on stage with the announcements doesn't own them. They're just kind of going through a list. It bugs us, it bothers us. Those people hear from us. Sometimes they just disappear and they're, never seen again. (laughs) They get one shot, one strike in your eye. I mean, we can just be crazy about the importance of presentations because in presentation needs to be engaging. Um, uh, And you're, I don't think this is in your notes. This is, that's not in your notes, but here's something important. People quit attending churches, not because, not because they disagree, but because they're disengaged. That's why people leave churches. People don't leave churches because they disagree with the theology. I mean, that happens occasionally, but they just go to a different church. The reason that the millennials are dropping out of church, it's not that they disagree with the theology necessarily, they're just disengaged. And the reason they're disengaged is because they're not engaged, and the reason they're not engaged is because the presentations were not engaging. So in order to grow a church, in order to build a church, in order to impact a community, we've gotta be crazy about engaging presentations. Generally speaking, it's, this is in your notes, back to your notes. Generally speaking, it's the presentation that makes in- information interesting. Now, this is so extremely important, okay? When you go to a restaurant, if you think about your favorite restaurant, you always order probably beef, chicken, or fish. It's not your favorite restaurant because they're the only one in town with alligator. You don't quit going to restaurants that only serve chicken, beef, or fish in order to go find a restaurant that serves exotic meats. The thing that makes your favorite restaurant your favorite restaurant isn't that they serve something other than those three things, it's how it's prepared. It's the presentation. I mean, there are great hamburgers and there are, huh, I wish I'd order something else hamburgers. There are great steaks and there are, you know what, I don't know where they get their meat, but I'm not going back there. There are great presentations of fish and then there's that, that was just so fishy I could hardly eat it. It's not what's preserved, it's not what's cooked, it's the presentation, it's the preparation. And the same is true when it comes to what we do. Here's, here's the deal, we're a bit limited. David beats Goliath every time. Now, what's going to make that engaging is not that the story ended different this time. What's going to make it engaging is how you tell the story. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with not nine and not 11, but 10 and only 10 every time. And you can't change the content. All you get to do is tweak 
the presentation. So an engaging presentation isn't about finding the hidden gospel or the lost gospel or the thing nobody knows that Jesus said that we only, it's not about new stuff. It's about a presentation of the things that have been around since the very beginning. So what makes information interesting is not necessarily the information, it's the presentation of the information. Attention span, this is important. Attention span is determined by the quality of the presentation. Do you know who teaches this is, or do you know how we know this is from comedians? Have you ever been to a live comedy show? And a man or woman will get up with no props, no point, no application, no scripture, no God, no notes, and 45 minutes later, you can't believe the time's gone by that fast. You don't even want him to stop. And if you stop by the bar on the way, it goes by even quicker. I, um, I told Jeff Foxworthy, I said, you have such an advantage that people come to hear you, they're drunk. If we had an open bar, we wouldn't have to have a band, okay? I wouldn't have to have some silly plasma. I could get up and be interesting and funny too. We gotta work for it in the local church, right? But the point is, yeah, you sh share that with your, your, your church when you get home. The, <laughs> The, the, the point being, the, the point being, if a comedian, if a comedian, there's no life application. Nobody's marriage is better when they're finished, right? Nobody goes home and knows how to parent their kids better. If comedians can keep us engaged for 45 minutes with no prop and no point and no God, good grief, when we get up with what we have to bring, we should be able to be engaging. An attention span is not determined by the content. Attention span is determined by how engaging the presentation is. Letter D in your notes. Engaging presentations require engaging presenters or an engaging means of presentation. It almost goes without saying. But in order to have an engaging presentation, you've gotta have an engaging presenter, we're gonna to get to that in just a minute, or an engaging means of communication. So the way we've dealt with that through the years is we decided to split out these two disciplines, content creators and content presenters. In the old days, in the traditional way, and the traditional view, or the traditional approach, I should say, who, the person who was creating the content was always the presenter, or the presenter was always expected to come up with the content. But here's the thing, those are two very different skill sets and those are two very different gifts. And there are people in your church, in fact, some of you are extremely good at creating content. In other words, I can sit down with you and say, we wanna do a series on, um, we wanna do a series on a dating for middle school or high school kids. And we could sit down and you would have all kinds of great ideas, all kinds, you'd find quotes, you'd find verses that we never even thought related to that. You'd tell stories. I could sit down with you and I would have so much content. But if I were to say to you now, I want you to get up, that, up there and present that to, you know, to a group of high school girls or a group of high school guys, you're like, not me, I do not do stage, I do not do microphone, I just do content. On the other hand, there are people, honestly, they can present anything and make it interesting, anything. Give them the phone book and 15 minutes later, it's like, that's the best thing I ever heard. They just presented the phone book, but they're just great presenters. Now in your church, in your church, there are some people who are great at this and some people who are great at this. And when you get them together, you get the best of both worlds. But if you expect all the presenters to come up with the content or all the smart people to come up with engaging presentations, you're gonna miss out on one or the other. So what we've done for years is we have looked for opportunities to marry these two disciplines, especially with curriculum, especially with middle school, especially with high school. But now we do this in the realm of preaching as well. Like there's a lot of guys that do what I do that'll sit down with a group of people and brainstorm through topics and brainstorm through content. Why? Because I'm a good presenter, but I'm not always, a, I'm not necessarily the best content creator, especially on certain subjects. We've done this with our pastors, our lead pastors. Again, we do this with curriculum. We do this for camps. We do this for um, in a series that we're gonna do for middle school or high school. You bring in the people, mind them for the content, and then you ask the question, Who's the best person in our organization to, create, to present this content? And here's what we've learned. Here's what some of you are learning. And here's what hopefully all of you will take away. There are people in your church that if you are simply recruiting in order to find volunteers for middle school, they will never, ever, ever raise their hand. They are not about to work with middle schoolers. I do not like middle schoolers. I don't even really like people shorter than me, but I really don't like middle schoolers. I'm not a middle school person. But come to find out they are an extraordinary content presenter. And when you can discover that person because of what they do professionally, because they do presentations all the time, because you heard them get up and give an announcement somewhere, and you say to them, look, 
We need someone to present this content to middle school. We're not asking you to volunteer for the middle school ministry. We're not asking you to even light middle schoolers. You don't even have to talk to them. You can come in the back door and leave when you're done. We just know that when you are on stage with a microphone, you're good. So would you take our content and present it to middle schoolers? And I don't have to eat with them. No, you don't have to eat with them. <laughs> and here's what we've discovered. Many, many people have ended up in family ministry, not because they wanted to get involved in family ministry, but because they were good at this and we cut them loose to do what they're good at. And the next thing they knew, 20 minutes had gone by and kids laughed at their jokes and seemed engaged. And they said, now, if you ever need me to do that again, I will. And that's how they got involved. So don't limit this to people who volunteer for an area. Find your good presenters, find your good content creators. I tell you some great content creators are your teachers, people involved in public education. They live in the world of content. They may not wanna deal with kids you know, seven days a week, but they know how to create content and they know where to find content. So if you can create a system that allows you to split up these two disciplines and bring them together appropriately, it's a gold mine. And that's what we've been doing for years. And we continue to do that even to the area of sermon development and team teaching as far as um, Sunday morning. So um, ask these questions in your notes, back to your notes. And our, is our culture characterized by a relentless commitment to engaging presentations at every level of the organization? Is our culture characterized by a relentless, a relentless commitment to engaging presentations at every level of the organization? Does our system allow us to put our best presenters in our most strategic presentation environments? Does our system allow us to put our best presenters in our most strategic presentation environments? Now, let me tell you what's gonna hurt you with this, especially if you're more of a traditional church model. In a traditional church model, there are things the education director always does. Why does he do that? He's the education director. Why does she do that? She's the education director. She's no good at it, I know, but that's what the education director does. Why does he do that? He's the pastor. He's no good at it, I know, but in this church, that's what the pastor always does, whether the pastor's good at it or not. You need a system that allows you to do away with that kind of nonsense and lean into the gifting of God that frees people to do what they do best regardless of their job description or their responsibility in the organization. And you can do this. You do this, people do this in business all the time. In fact, you don't survive in business if you aren't good at what you've been hired to do. They just fire you. In church world, we just pat you on the head and say, God bless you and you know, I'm, you know, God, you'll do better next time sweetheart, okay? We, I don't know why we think what we do is less important than what happens in the marketplace. So figure out or create a system that allows you to put people where they do what they do best and cuts them loose to do what they do best. And then the third one, are our presenters evaluated and coached? Are our uh, presenters evaluated and coached? I'm telling you, if you're in a system, well, she does that because that's what that job description ask, you know, requires of her, but nobody evaluates her, that's just her job, you're never gonna get the best out of your people. Anytime there's a presentation, it must be evaluated. Every single presenter needs to be evaluated formally because as I said earlier, every presentation is being evaluated anyway. We might as well learn something from it. And inviting evaluation is terrifying. It's terrifying. I, when, I've only met Joel Osteen one time and I was at Lakewood and he and I did a, 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 the thing with 40 church leaders of large churches and we were interviewed about these same questions. And so we had just met that day. So I would answer a question, then ask Joel the same question. And we kind of went back and forth. It was a lot of fun and I love Joel. And so one of the questions was about preaching and presenting things. And I made the statement. I said, you know, if you watch yourself preach, if you watch yourself preach, you will either get better or you'll quit. <laughs> Cause it's so painful to watch yourself preach. It's like, oh gosh, I wouldn't even come back. You know, you'll either, I said, you'll either get better or you'll quit. So then Joel was up there and they asked Joel essentially the same question. <laughs> Joel said, he said, well, it's like Andy said. <laughs> it's like Andy said. He said, if you watch yourself preach, you'll either get better, well, you'll just get better. <laughs> and everybody started laughing and he was up there like, what did I say? I said, Joel, you just can't go negative at all. You can't even, it's like, you just, you'll just get better. I'm like, but you won't. You'll either get better or quit, no matter what Joel says. No, you'll just get better. So the point being, everybody, need, everybody needs to be evaluated. It's the only way, it's the only way 
to get better. Um, we, after I preach the nine o'clock service, a group of three or four, sometimes five people come back to my little green room backstage with their clipboards and their iPads and their laptops, and we talk about it. What was clear? What wasn't clear? Don't, I don't think I'd say that. I don't think that you, know, you need to tuck your shirt in. You know, did, Andy, smile. Come on, smile. You look like you, you just, okay, well, smile. So, and, and I went, not too long ago, um, there was a CNN reporter doing, um, he wasn't actually doing a story, but we're friends, and I invited him to church, and he um, came up to the green room with me, and so all the um, people came in and kind of went through that nine o'clock, how to make nine o'clock better and what I need to do and what they need to do. You know, we kind of did an evaluation because, you know, I want to get better. So anyway, after they all left, it was just me and John were in the room. He said, I can't, this is what he said, quote, I can't believe you let them talk to you like that. <laughs> That's what he said. I said, why? He said, well, all the other pastors of big churches, I know they're all God's anointed. They don't let anybody talk to them like that. I said, well, I'm not God's anointed. I'm just trying to get better at what I do. He said, well, I can't believe you let them talk to you like that. And I thought, that's the difference between our culture and a lot of other cultures. The only way to get better is to evaluate, and evaluation is painful. But remember, you're being evaluated anyway. You might as well learn something from it. Last one, does our system create opportunities for our best content creators to partner with our best um, presenters? I gotta move on. Another couple stories, but we'll just move on. All right, number three. Helpful content, helpful content. You gotta have an appealing setting, you gotta have engaging presentations, and you have to have helpful content. Uh, we're not talking about true, we're assuming it's true. We need for it to be helpful. By helpful, we mean useful. Is it useful? Is there anything to do with this? I, I know it's true, Jesus said, Paul said, I know Peter said, James said, the book of Genesis teaches, okay, we believe it's true, but is it helpful? Um, Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount that it's the people who do what I say, they're like the man who built his house upon the rock, and it's the people that don't do what I say, they're like the people who built their house on the sand. The significance of what he said being, everybody in the audience heard what I had to say. It's only the people that do something with what I just said that will make a difference. Listening doesn't make any difference. Doing is what makes all the difference, which means every time we get up and present, there needs, needs to be something we can do because doing is what makes the difference. And when you obey, your faith intersects with God's faithfulness and your faith grows. Letter B, helpful content is content that directly addresses thinking and living. Helpful content is, in other words, it's gonna help me think different or live better. Think different or live different. Think different about something or live differently. Letter C, content should be stage of life specific. You think you probably already know that. There's just stories we don't tell, you know, babies and toddlers, you know, and there's stories that when we tell them in big church, we say, you know, put your kids in up street and have your teenagers on the front row. That's what we say. Next week, we're talking about sex. So put your children in up street and put your high school kids on the front row. We're talking about sex. So there's age and stage appropriate content and we need to be sensitive to that. And I know you know that. Information, back to your notes, Information that does not address a felt need is perceived as irrelevant. Now, it may not be irrelevant, but if it doesn't touch on a felt need and if you haven't created a sense of urgency around the content, the most important content in the world may be perceived as irrelevant even though it's extraordinary, extraordinarily relevant. Try to teach a teenager how to change a flat tire before they've ever had a flat tire. Is it important? Yes. Is it relevant? Yes. It's perceived as a complete waste of time. Mom, I don't need to know how to do this. Well, it's not until you've had a flat tire, but then it's too late. So we have to salt the content to make people want it, and we have to make it practical and useful and helpful so they'll know or understand just how relevant and how important it really is. And also in your notes, information that isn't perceived as useful is perceived as irrelevant, and lastly, irrelevant doesn't stick. It just doesn't stick. It's in one ear and out the other. So here's the questions to ask. Is our content helpful? Is our content helpful? Is our content helpful? And if not, why not? And what can we do about it? In fact, we'll walk away from messages or walk away from presentations and say, you know what? It was interesting and it was engaging. It just wasn't all that helpful. Do our content creators and presenters understand that the goal is a renewed mind and changed behavior? Is our content age and stage of life specific? So bottom line, the moral of the story is simply this. Of every single environment, of every single environment, ask these questions. Is it, was the setting appealing? 
Was the content, was the presentation engaging and was the content helpful? Was the setting appealing or is the setting appealing? That's how you evaluate. Was the presentation engaging and was the content helpful? And when you can answer yes to these three ideas or yes to those three questions, then chances are you have created an irresistible ministry environment that God will use to bring about life change. And as picky as it seems, as unspiritual as it seems, as practical as it seems, as, as worldly as it may seem, it's absolutely critical. And since we believe we're about the most important task in the world, and since we believe our message is the most important message in the world, then we need to go overboard in terms of creating environments that attract people, keep people, and communicate that we're serious about what we do. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the men and women that came around me 18 or 19 years ago and impressed upon me the importance of some of these things because I just didn't get it. Father, thank you that I'm such a better communicator because I get to communicate in such extraordinary environments that set people up to listen and open their hearts to what your word has to say. So Father, as we think about our buildings, as we think about our facilities, as we think about set up and tear down, as we think about what's next, would you please give us the humility to listen to the people around us who are better at this than we are? and give us the creativity we need to marry those content creators with the content presenters that can attract and keep people's attention? And would you give us eyes to see our churches and eyes to see our environments the way that you see them, that we would do our best with what you've given us to work with. And Father, I pray that every single person listening, every single person who's a part of this presentation would learn how to be more attractional for the sake of the people who you love and who you want to see attracted to your local church. In Jesus' name, amen.